تذكر يوما كنت تعانق دمعة الفكر تناجي الله في صبر وترجو رحمة تسري فعاش القلب إخلاصا وصرت تحوم كالطير تحلق في ثقافات وتنهل من روب الخير <تصفيق> السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم، الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد. I praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى for making me smile today. And I praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى for making me meet with you today. And I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing me with breath and with the heartbeat and with the ability to be here this afternoon. And I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me iman and I ask him to grant me death with iman and the same for every one of us. Ameen. And I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making me meet beautiful brothers and sisters of mine in faith whom perhaps I never ever have met before. And I see you and I feel the bond between myself and yourself. So I praise Allah for this and I thank Him. Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whom Allah has chosen to bring the goodness to us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless him and his entire household, those who supported him from the very beginning, those who struggled and strove with him from the very beginning, and all his companions and all those who coming down the generations have preserved this deen and spread it in a way that today it has come to us. May Allah bless them all and may we all be blessed and our children as well. <laughs> the beautiful greeting of Islam is Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Do you know what it means? It means may peace be upon you. That's the greeting of Islam. May peace be upon you. When I see someone, I'm making a prayer for them to ask Allah Almighty to grant them peace. That is Islam. I, it is wrong for me to say hi or bye before I say Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. May the peace of Allah be upon you. I want you to be at peace. It's my prayer for you, really. That's what I'm saying. That's the beginning. If I don't greet in that way, I am actually not a good Muslim. If I look at you and I say, hi, is that fine? I need to first say assalamu alaikum, then I can say hi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors, really. So, this is one of the biggest signs that Islam is a religion of peace. It starts off with peace. The moment you see my face, you're supposed to be hearing a word that has in it some form of peace. It's a prayer for peace. If I'm praying for you for peace, do you know what Allah says? Whenever you are greeted with a greeting, then respond that greeting with a better greeting or at least reply it with something exactly the same. So it is my duty, subhanAllah, when I see you, I say assalamu alaikum as a bare minimum. But it would be good for me to add to it wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I can tell you what that means. I'm saying may peace be upon you, which is the prayer we just spoke about. And I can add to the prayer saying, may the mercy of Allah be upon you and may his blessings also be upon you. Wow. Three things one time I'm asking for you. So one day when I explained to my child, to my child this, that you know it's a prayer. He said, so dad, when someone says that, can't I just say, Amin? <laughs> it's a good way of looking at it. If someone says, may peace be upon you, say, Amin. Isn't it? But the reality is, Allah says, no, hang on. When you say, may peace be upon you to someone, the angels are saying, may peace be upon you too. So it's an automatic response from the angels. And it's better for the angels to actually make the dua for you than for me or you to make a dua for someone, subhanAllah, meaning to supplicate. So the Quran says, when I greet you by right, you are supposed to respond with something equal. You're supposed to say, wa alaykum as salam, wa alaykum as salam, and consider it an act of worship, consider it something very important. 
And what is more important, my brothers and sisters, and this is something that many people forget, more important than just greeting you is to make sure you really mean what you say. If I tell you, Assalamu Alaikum, may peace be upon you, but as soon as I leave you, I'm busy stabbing you behind your back. I'm busy saying bad things about you, backbiting about you. I was lying. I'm a hypocrite. I'm not a good Muslim. I really, I'm not a person worth my weight. Subhanallah. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us to be protected from hypocrisy. Do not be from amongst those who do something against what they actually say. Ya in Surah Saf, Allah says, O you who believe, why do you say that which you do not do? Why is there a disparity between what you are saying and what you are doing? We need to create uniformity. That is when you will achieve the proper peace. So when I say, Assalamu Alaikum to you, I really supposed to go out of my way to make sure you are not harmed. Because peace would require that there is no harm against you. This is something important. Imagine this is the first point of stopping with a Muslim. The first point of meeting, for example, with a Muslim, Assalamu Alaikum, and you're supposed to try and break into a beautiful smile at least. Try and break into a smile. So instead of saying, Assalamu Alaikum, <laughs> look at you. I'm supposed to say, Assalamu Alaikum. Wow, it looks so good. It's automatically uplifting to me. You're praying for me for peace, and you're making me feel good at the same time by smiling. Even if you don't have tea, it's still an iman. <laughs> Remember that, mashallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And then I'm supposed to hear the response. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah bless you too. And remember, may Allah's mercy be upon you too. And may Allah's blessings be upon you too. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Amen. Now that's my introduction. And I hope, and I, I really hope that we're all feeling at peace. Because when I got up here, and I said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, I really meant it. And I was smiling before I actually got up here. I was already smiling because I'm seeing these beaming, radiant faces, all excited. I said, I have to take a photo of this. I have to make sure that it stays with me as a memory. After, after I'm gone, I will remember one day we went to Kuching, mashallah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And mashallah, I met my brothers and sisters and we felt so much at peace and at ease. Islam is a religion of peace. It's not a religion of war. It's not a religion of harm. Really, it isn't. What happens across the globe, sadly, is not Islam. Sometimes it is politics that has hijacked Islam in order to forward some agenda of it. May Allah protect us. And we, the innocent lot, the bulk, the majority, get tagged as bad people. It becomes difficult to live as a Muslim. People sometimes want to abandon their hijab. They want to abandon their Islamic identity. Their name turns from Muhammad to Mo and Abdul Aziz to Zizi. <laughs> Just because they are worried that if I say Abdul Aziz, that's it. The people are not going, they're going to look at me and think this guy is a barbaric terrorist. Astaghfirullah. Whereas that's not Islam. So they say Zizi. That sounds like electricity. Allah <laughs> safeguard us. Really? And then I heard another one, there was a sister, when I asked, what's your name? She says, Dija. I'm wondering, what's Dija? Is it a Muslim name? No, 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 sorry, it's Khadija. But I'm just saying the end of it because, you know, you know, I don't know. I really don't know. It's a beautiful name, Khadija. Don't just say Dija, Dija, subhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. There's no Dija and Tima. You know, if Dija is short for Khadija, then Tima would be short for Fatima. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say God. It's a beautiful faith. I believe when I say my name is Ismail and my name is Abdul Aziz and my name is Maryam and Fatima, it is me who will be able to portray the beautiful image of Islam by not hiding my identity. What's the point of all the good people hiding their identity and only the bad ones are the ones who say our name is this and our name is that and everyone knows all oh, those are the bad names. How many a time would we know a Muslim name and we know someone with a similar name who's done something bad? Why don't we change it by doing something good so that it's as soon as someone hears a, a name uh, and they think of something bad they've done, they think of another 10 names, similar names with good things that have been done. So at work, your name is Muhammad, mashallah. You don't just say, my name is Mo. 
really? You say my name is Muhammad, so they know you are Muhammad. But you are the most polite, you greet everyone, you help as many as you can, you are honest, you are upright, you come on time, you don't steal and cheat and deceive. People know, wow, I know a Muhammad who's really a brilliant person. You manage to change the image of Islam, which means the, the, the wrong perception of Islam. You manage to change it because you lived by Islam and you were proud of it. How many of you as Muslims here today are proud of being Muslims? Put up your hand. All of you. MashaAllah. SubhanAllah. We are happy to be Muslim. So that is because we know that it's a, it's a religion of peace. How many of you really believe it's a religion of peace? Put up your hands. There we are, all of us. But mind you, I should say, how many do not believe it's a religion of peace? We might be able to see a few hands. And I can tell you something and I want to ask you a question. How many non-Muslims are in this crowd? Put up your hand. Okay, there we are. We have non-Muslims, mashallah. I want to ask you a very important question. Do you feel unsafe in this hall? If you feel unsafe, put up your hand. Well, no one's put up their hand, not even one. It means you are so safe. It means none of us here are terrorists, subhanAllah. None of us here are harmful people. We all promote peace. I'm sure you feel so happy, so secure. You can see my smile. That's for you guys, mashallah. <laughs> MashaAllah, you are our brothers and sisters in humanity before faith, SubhanAllah. We are human beings, SubhanAllah. And this is why we say evidence that Islam is a religion of peace is the fact that in Muslim crowds you have non-Muslims who are sitting and they feel so secure, they are happy, they laugh with us, they, they, they share moments with us, they are, SubhanAllah, we reach out to them, they reach out to us. That is how it's supposed to be. I'm sure I was born a Muslim, alhamdulillah. From amongst you, there might be those who were not born Muslims. But weren't you taught from the very beginning that Islam is a religion of goodness and peace? And haven't we lived by those values all our lives? Haven't we? Yes, we have. So that would mean that those who are coming nowadays with some new ideology to say, you're supposed to be barbaric. Anyone who's not a Muslim, oh, I no way. We've never known this. It's not in the Quran. It's not in the Sunnah. We who have been for centuries following Islam and at least in our own lives for decades perhaps, we've never ever come across barbaric teachings in this beautiful teach, uh, religion of Islam. And this is why we say, be careful of those who try to contaminate your mind to make you think that, you know what, these people don't deserve to live. I want to tell you something extremely important. All of us, without exception, some generations back, our forefathers were not Muslim. Do you agree? Yes. If the teaching was killing all non-Muslims, they would have been killed a long time ago and we wouldn't have even been here. But the teaching was, come out and be honest, be upright. So that is why this part of the world, a lot of Islam has come through upright and honest business dealers. Am I right or wrong? Through upright and honest people who came in, they, they intermarried, they were honest and upright, they looked after the one another's interests, they made sure that they, there was peace in business. You know, there can be war in business as well. When, you're, when you want to block other people out, no one must have any profit besides me. I must be the big man. If someone is doing well and he's coming small, I need to block him and stop him. That's not Islam. Islam says there is no way that the rich will become richer at the expense of the poor becoming poorer. That's why interest is haram. Usually is haram. There is no way that the rich is, are allowed to become richer at the expense of the poor becoming poorer. You can become richer, yes, but not at the expense of the poor becoming poorer. You need to all benefit. And this is why when you are considerate of the buyer when selling and the seller when buying, you are a proper Muslim. Allah has mercy upon a, a person who is considerate of the buyer when selling his product and considerate of the seller when buying a product. Which means I make sure that he's also happy when he turns away. I don't need to sell you something worth 10 ringgit and con you that this is a hundred ringgit and you pay it and then I count myself a smarty pants. There's nothing smart about that. You cheated someone, that's all you did. If it's 10 and you explain to them, look, this is 10, but I really need 11. Wow, if they pay you, alhamdulillah. And this is why it is a major sin to lie about your cost price when you want to sell something. Did you know that? Major sin. So for example, if I uh, want to sell my product, the cost of it was 10 ringgit and I want to sell it at 15, or I want to sell it at 20, for example, and I tell you, I, wallahi, I got it at 19, and I'm lying. 
The hadith says that person on the day of judgment, Allah won't even look at them. They won't have a standing. Why did you lie? You didn't have to tell them your cost price. Why? Because we want peace in business. We want to be able to deal with you tomorrow and the next day. If you rip off someone today, tomorrow you won't have a deal with them. But if you give them a good deal today, they will be back with you in business and perhaps you can flourish together. Peace in business. Islam teaches you peace of the heart and mind by worshipping Allah alone. That's what Islam teaches us. La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. We've heard that a thousand, a million or a billion times. But what does it mean? It means there is none worthy of worship besides my maker. Oh, no one can debate with that statement. Did you hear what I just said? None worthy of worship besides my maker. I will not worship anyone but my maker. That's what is the meaning of peace. You get peace once you know I'm not taking any risks in worship. I worship my maker, that's it. How many of us do sujood, prostration, to anyone but Allah? Nobody. We all prostrate to Allah. When we are in sujood, do you know what is the supplication? Subhana Rabbi al A'la. We are praising Allah who is our Rabb, meaning my creator, my maker, my cherisher, my sustainer, my provider, my protector, my curer, the one in control of my eyes and my nose and my breathing and my heart and my feet and my hair and my wealth and my sustenance and my happiness and all forms of goodness and the one who is in absolute control of every aspect of existence. I have put my head on the ground for you and I am declaring you to be the greatest. Wow, that is true peace. You get proper peace when you put your head on the ground for the one who made you. That's the meaning of La ilaha illallah. That's what peace is all about. That is Islam. And then we say Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I bear witness that Muhammad, may peace be upon him, is the final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also bear witness that Jesus, may peace be upon him, Abraham, may peace be upon him, Moses, may peace be upon him, Aaron, may peace be upon him, Noah, may peace be upon him, Lot, may peace be upon him, Ishaq, may peace be upon him, Isaac, Ishmael, and all of them, may peace be upon them all, were messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, whenever we hear any name of a prophet, what should we say? For example, we say, Jesus, and then what should we say? Alayhi <laughs> salam. You know what it means? What does it mean in English? Say it again. Peace be upon him. Why? Because we have been taught peace. This is the peace. Alayhi salam. As salam means peace. May peace be upon him. Why? May he be at peace. He has done us a huge favor and Allah has chosen him to come and to teach the globe what is right and wrong. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is our Nabi, the final Nabi. We happen to be part of his ummah. But it does not mean we disrespect another messenger. If someone is blasphemous against Jesus, will it hurt us? Yes, indeed. Why? Because we believe that it is incorrect to utter a single word of disrespect against any one of the messengers, may peace be upon them all. If someone has to draw a cartoon of the Prophet Moses, will it hurt us? Yes, definitely. It will hurt us because we believe in peace. If you want peace, stop insulting people. If you want peace, you need to understand that you must appreciate those whom the Almighty has sent to you. That is peace. If I was allowed to swear anyone and everyone, can I bring about any peace? I come to you and I swear you, come to her and swear her, I go that side and swear this one, I look at you and I look at you as someone who is nothing. Is that fair? Where the hadith says, Annasu sawa siya ka asnani al misht. People are equal, like the teeth of a comb. Have you ever seen a comb with teeth or jagged? Not at all. You have all the teeth of a comb are all in line so that you can comb your hair. You can comb your hair, subhanAllah. So, Muhammad, peace be upon his, him, is telling us that people are all equal, like the teeth of a comb. I must respect because I tell you something. You need to reach out to the non-Muslims more than you reach out to the Muslims. For the simple reason that if Allah has used you to guide one person towards Islam, the hadith says it's better for you than what the world contains in terms of materialistic items of value. Wallahi, the Prophet ﷺ says to Ali radiallahu anhu on the day of Khaybar, and it was the time of war. It was the time of war. 
He says, O oh, Ali, remember one thing. Wallahi la an yahdi Allah bika rajulan wahidan khayrun laka min humur al I swear by Allah that if Allah has used you to guide even one person, it is better for you than the most valuable of the material items of this world. At that time, the red camera. What was that meaning? It means reach out to people. Imagine if someone uh, comes to you now and says, Oh, my sister, I've been watching how you live and I really want to enter. You've inspired me. I want to enter the fold of Islam. You might start crying. Agree? Because you're thinking, Oh Allah, what did I do? This person's inspired by me. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. And you will start crying. And you will perhaps, you will then let them read the Shahada. And do you know that is the biggest gift that you could have ever had? The biggest gift. For someone, Allah to use you, Allah used you to guide someone. Now to be honest with you, if we are bad to them, if we don't greet them, if we are someone who really doesn't have any form of goodness towards those who disbelieve, for example, what are, you, what are we going to come up with? Do you think anyone will come up to you and say, I'm inspired by you, yet you've been swearing them every day. And really, I feel that this is a beautiful faith. You are the one whom I've been watching your life for so long. We've been working for 10 years. Today is the day I decide that what you are doing in your faith is actually correct. And I want to be a part of it. You will never be able to achieve that unless you live by Islam and you are an open-minded, broad-minded person who understands that all of us somewhere back were not Muslims. Someone, somehow, may Allah bless them, whoever they were, who were to my great, great grandfathers, may Allah bless them, grant them Jannah. I mean, whoever worked on your parents or grandparents or on you or on your great, great grandfathers generations back, whoever came to this part of the world to bring you the goodness, may Allah bless them because we were not in guidance at that time. Now, Alhamdulillah, we have some form of guidance. This is the religion of peace. This is what peace is all about, to worship your maker. Subhana Rabbi al We say, La ilaha illallah, there is none worthy of worship besides my maker. I render no act of worship besides to my maker. Subhanallah. And I declare that not only Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but all the messengers of God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they deserve to have the minimum respect next to their name should be a prayer from us. May peace be upon them. That's the religion of peace. And Islam teaches us to be at peace with ourselves. We are supposed to be content. How do you get to become peaceful within yourself? One of the most important factors is a teaching of Iman, known as Al-Iman bil qadai wal Qadr. To believe in what Allah has predestined for you. Allah has chosen for you. Let me explain. In Islam, we believe that Allah has given us energy, capacity, ability, power. Allah gave it to us. Allah has given me muscle. Allah has given me the ability to walk, to talk, to do things. He's given me a brain. Allah expects me to use all these faculties in order to achieve goodness. In order to achieve goodness. But if I've used all my faculties and the ability Allah has given me, and I still did not achieve, I need to surrender to the will of Allah. Say for example, I worked very hard and I still failed my examination. Doesn't that happen sometimes? Well, the examiner must have been someone who didn't know how to mark, isn't he? <laughs> well, to be honest, I worked very hard and I still failed my examination. I don't need to become depressed. I can write again. I can write a subject. I'm sure I don't want people to put up their hands, but I'm sure from amongst us, there are so many people who must have repeated a subject or two. See the people nodding their heads. Yes, mashallah, they have. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, it's correct. But today where you are sitting, that's all past. It's gone. We passed it third time round. But we passed it, mashallah. And this is why if you fail once in anything, get up and repeat. The goodness. Do better the next time. Even if you have sinned, no need to become depressed. Not at all. Why? Because you are at peace with your maker. <coughs> oh my maker, I did something wrong. Very bad. <coughs> I regret it, I admit it, I ask your forgiveness, I'm not doing it again. Here I am getting up and doing better the next time. Wow, that's the religion of peace. A religion of peace can never ever be of value unless it is based on mercy. So Islam is based on mercy from the beginning to the end. For as long as you are breathing, you have the hope in the mercy of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask His forgiveness and He will forgive you. Let me prove it to you that it's based on mercy. 
When I want to start anything important, there is a phrase I should say. Do you agree? What is the phrase? Say the whole phrase. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Do you know what the meaning of it is? In the name of Allah most gracious, most merciful. In the name of Allah most beneficent, most merciful. Ar Rahman and Rahim can also be translated as most merciful, most merciful. Ar Rahman and Rahim, most merciful in a broad manner and most merciful in a specialized manner. That's the meaning. How come we are taught right at the beginning of everything and anything that you need to declare the mercy of Allah? Subhanallah. If I want barakah, if I want blessings in whatever I do, I need to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kullu amalin lam yubtada'u fihi Bismillah fahuwa akta. The hadith says any, any act, anything, anything meaningful that you want to do, if you have not started with Bismillah, there's going to be no blessing in that item. So Bismillah. You want to get into your car, you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You jump into your car. Or at least minimum Bismillah, the name of Allah. And if you want to describe Allah, he says, at that juncture, if you want to describe Allah, you must describe Him with the qualities of mercy, nothing else. It's wrong for me to say, in the name of Allah, who punishes severely. <laughs> Have you ever heard someone say that? Never. In the name of Allah, who declares that people will be in hell. Can you say that? Never. But you say, in the name of Allah, most forgiving, most merciful. So I feel at peace when I hear that statement, because I know I'm a human. I've done things that are wrong. And I will sometimes perhaps fall and fall again. But each time I fall, I remember Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wow. In the name of Allah, the most forgiving, the most merciful, the most beneficent. SubhanAllah. That's the beginning. And guess what? There is a, verse, a chapter of the Quran known as Surah Al-Fatiha. It means the opening chapter of the Quran. It has in it seven verses. Every one of us should be knowing it off by heart. And no unit of prayer is completed without you reading that surah. Do you agree? So when I start my prayer, I say, Allahu Akbar, the one who made me is the greatest. Today, people across the globe have been tuned wrongly by the media to believe that the term Allahu Akbar is a statement that's uttered before you bomb someone. Stop it. Stop it. Wallahi, that's a very, very big misunderstanding. Allahu Akbar. You know, just now, if all of us had to say Allahu Akbar, and if we were living in a nation that's not Muslim, perhaps, that has been brainwashed by Fox News, they would probably all run away from us. <laughs> but all we're saying is the one who made me is the greatest. The one who made me is the greatest, really. And when I say that, as I start my prayer, I'm declaring the greatness of my maker, then nobody can deny that statement, to be honest with you. No one. The one who made you is the greatest. You've got to say, yes, he is. Then we've got to start off by uttering a few words and then by reciting verses of the Quran. And do you know what they are? We would start off, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Agree? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Then? Then what do you say? Let's hear it. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Most beneficent, most merciful. Or, most merciful, most merciful. That's Allah. I started my prayer, and as I folded my hands and I'm saying, Praise be to Allah, Lord of the world, most beneficent, most merciful, owner of the day of judgment. You alone we worship. You alone we ask for help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, not the path of those who have earned your anger, nor the path of those who are astray. Amen. Wow. How peaceful is that? I'm asking the Almighty for guidance. The problem with us is we don't even know the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha. And if we do, we don't think about it when we're reading it. Because for us, I've got to cook. I just put everything on the stove. Allahu Akbar. I know of sisters and brothers who've told me that, you know, when I start my Salah and I'm worried about the phone ringing, and when it leaves, I just say, 
How is it you can go and start that? Yeah, okay, so proud What peace are you going to have? You want peace? Guess what? Switch off your phone. You want peace in your marriage? Switch off your phone. <laughs> Every little while, you know, you're a married man, your pillow. We, we're supposed to have something romantic called pillow talk, subhanAllah. Pillow talk now, it means speak to someone else on the phone while on the pillow. That's what it means. <laughs> really? And a little while later, tick, tick, and you take your, your phone from under your pillow. And you're looking, what's that? What's the time? Two in the morning, go to sleep, my brother. You want peace? Switch off that phone. You will have peace. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, all of us. Wallahi, technology is a big gift from Allah, but it is also a great test. Every blessing is a test. Did you know that? Every blessing you have is a test. Your health is a test, your wealth is a test, and your iPhone 6 is a test. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. Really? So if you want peace, you need to be disciplined. And this is why Islam has a lot of rules and regulations. Because through that discipline, you'll be at peace. Imagine if I were to look at every woman and try to get them into bed with me. What would happen? I would live a life full of ripping apart myself, being very unsatisfied, dissatisfied, and everyone would be upset with me, and so many people would want to actually kill me. Because they know the type of person that this is. But if I am respectful, I lower my gaze, I appreciate what Allah has blessed me with, I am helped, I am really thankful to Allah. If I want to do things, I do them the halal way, and I make sure that I've disciplined myself. When I, you know, I don't need to engage in immorality to enjoy my life, because everyone who's engaged in immorality has actually removed the peace from their life. That's a guarantee. I need to protect myself. We spoke about pornography yesterday in Kuala Lumpur, subhanAllah. And one of the big points was that those who actually watch this thinking that it's delightful end up depressed. They end up disrespecting the opposite sex and their own spouses. They, they become so satisfied with haram, with that which is prohibited, that, that they have no time for halal. This is why we say, cut it out, it can never come about with goodness. So Islam has a lot of rules and regulations, we admit hands down. Yes, it does. But every rule and regulation Islam has, is there in order to bring about your inner and outer peace. You know, with all due respect to people who dress however they want to dress, if you see someone who's dressed in a way that they're revealing every important organ of their body, Look at the way they walk and then you see someone who's draping with a gold dress with mashallah, beautiful elegance and they're covered in a beautiful way. You can see the peace and you can see the lack of peace. You can see it. Brothers, I'm not encouraging you to go and look. <laughs> what I mean is, it's clear. I've come across sisters who have dressed appropriately after they used to be from amongst those who didn't dress properly. And they say completely, you know how conscious I was of making sure that my butt is okay and my legs are okay and my cleavage is looking, you know, okay and everything is fake. Half of it is fake and my face is all draped up and everything. And the way I walk, I was never at peace. I'm always worried about what people are going to say and I'm waiting for a comment. If someone doesn't comment, I become angry. <laughs> I do all this. I spend three hours coming in country saying, Woo! <laughs> There's no peace, no peace at all. Beautiful clothes, alhamdulillah. And be an upright person, walk with respect, dignity. You don't need the whole world running behind you because in that case, you won't be leading your life. You will be leading a life that is actually enslaved by them. I can explain quickly what that means. When you dress for yourself, you're actually dressing for yourself. You're not bothered about people's comments and what people are saying and whether they say it or don't. So I can easily walk out of my house. I can easily go to the mall store. Someone knocks on my door. I can easily open it because I know I'm myself. But if you're living for everyone else and their comments and their looks and everyone to say wow and to put their likes on Facebook and so on. So when you, when you put your leg this way, you take a picture and put it on Facebook and you want people to say wow, you're beautiful. Wallahi, my sisters, you are beautiful without their comments because a lot of them are just liars. I promise you, they want you to feel good. Allah knows He created you. You want real peace, you need to know something. And that is, subhanallah, just dress appropriately. Do you know when someone knocks on your door, you can quickly go there. Those who are enslaved by this type of, perhaps, dressing, 
If someone knocks on the door, they have to wait for 30 minutes before the sister can actually, you know, make herself up because she's so embarrassed. They can't see me like this. And you're busy sitting and sitting 20 minutes. Someone comes and opens the door and makes you sit down and you're saying, but you know what, I'm waiting and waiting. 25 minutes later, you walk out and as you're walking out, hey, she comes running. I'm so sorry, I'm late. You're like, you need to go and talk yourself up. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who are proud of what He's given us, who are happy with what He's given us. That is what we say when we say, you need to be happy with those things that you can do nothing about. Today I look like something. It's Allah. You look like something. It's Allah. Yes, I may want to meet Him myself. I may want to, you know, look a little within limits. Yes, that's fine. No problem. But when I go beyond the limits and I start getting excited, there comes a time when you won't be happy with your body parts and you'll start putting in that which is fake just for people to look at. You know what this person, wow, the behind is fake, the breasts are fake, everything is fake, your face is fake. Wallahi, I'm saying this without being ashamed of it because it's happening on the globe. People are not happy with their noses and their eyes and their chins and their ears and everything is actually now Botox and worse. What peace do you have? No peace. Your husband wants to hold you say, I'm not born that is silicone. Don't hold it. Yeah, <laughs> really? Yeah. It's a reality. What peace do you have? Islam says it's haram. Don't do that. Leave it out. If it is really to return something from abnormality to normal, it's permissible. Your nose is bent, you want to bring it straight, allow. Your teeth are skewed, you want to straighten them, allow. But you're just not happy because you know what, uh, I, I need to add a bit of volume. Astaghfirullah, it's happening. I, I want to say it as it is because wallahi, it's a sickness in the West. And I hope it doesn't come to the East. Do you know what's the sickness? Oh, people don't look at my behind. Now let me make sure that they do. So now the pants I wear, the new pants that, that are being sold, you know, they're actually silicone pants. Wow, it looks big. For what? You want people to look at you. Is that what it's all about? What peace will you have, subhanAllah? Your own husband who knows what you're worth will look at someone else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. This is where Islam comes in. Today I've spoken about peace in Islam from a totally different angle. The reason I did this, we've spoken about peace so many times from other angles. It's about time we said, by living and abiding by these rules and regulations, Wallahi, you are guaranteed peace. And this is why one of the names of Allah is As-Salam. The owner of peace, the source of peace. The one who has every form of peace. And Allah says, the greeting not only in this world is Salam, but even when you enter paradise, تَحِيَّتُهُمْ يَوْمَ يَلْقَوْنَهُ سَلَامٌ The greeting on the day that you will meet with him, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will be salam, will be the greeting of peace. <coughs> it's all about peace. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us peace. So my brothers and sisters, if we take a look at this beautiful faith of ours, we will come to realize that from its very name, from its very name, it emanates peace. And that's the last thing I want to talk about. Al-Islam. Islam, what does it mean? It means two things. It's salamun, which means peace. And it also comes from al-Islam, which means submission. And we have to combine the two in order to understand what it means. I will only achieve peace if I submit. That's what Islam means. So if we have not submitted, we don't achieve peace, even if we call ourselves Muslim. But you know, I say, okay, by the way, I'm a Muslim, but you know, I'll still drink. What does drinking do to you? Alcohol. People say, oh, like, like social drinking, no problem. Wallahi, number one, it's a waste of money. It's haram, that's there, we know that. Waste of money. Number two, intoxication. Do you know Allah says one of the biggest blessings you have is the brain that is the distinguishing factor between you and the animal and this is why it is prohibited to block the brain in any way whatsoever. So by you blocking it even 1%, 5%, you're actually sort of joining the animals. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not let that happen. In fact, we become worse because I know of so many people and younger people are beginning to drink and beginning to engage in, you know, part, partaking of intoxicants and so on, different ways, the types of drugs, it's become a menace. 
It's become such that some countries have warned us, including Malaysia. When we are landing, they say, hey, Malaysia has got some strict rules regarding this and regarding that, and it may hold some big punishment. If you are bringing anything in, you better be careful. There's an announcement on the aircraft. I'm sure you know that. Especially for this country. Mashallah, it's good because it wakes people up. And it shows us that it's a problem. And it shows us that it will snatch away your peace. You see people on drugs, they feel high for a while. Hey. Oh, certainly. All right. And he feels like he's on sky. He's sky high. He feels like he's on cloud nine. In fact, maybe even cloud ten, to be honest. And then what happens? Once it fades away, he's finished. His health is gone. His wealth is gone. He begins to steal in the house. He's a pain. He's a menace. He cannot get along with his wife. His children will have to abandon him. And what example does he have? Drugs. May Allah protect us and our offspring and the Ummah at large and humanity at large. Amen. Allah, it's a menace. So Islam says you're not allowed. You can't. It's a rule. If you want peace, stay away from it. And you know what? If we say, okay, social drinking, social drinking, who is going to gauge what is social drinking? I know one man who was sitting next to me on a certain aircraft and drinking and drinking. You must have had bottles and bottles and he still looked a bit sober. So I spoke to him and I told him, hey, he says, no, I'm used to it. And I'm thinking to myself, well, he told me that some others might even just have a few sips and they might go tipsy. But he says, I can have a lot because I've been doing it since I was young. Now, I was thinking to myself, the debate would be, how much is just a social amount? Because of that entire debate, we know that in Islam, it's just totally prohibited. Look, cut it out and don't go there. Carry on. Use the money for something more constructive. And this is why, my beloved brothers and sisters, I want to take the liberty to call upon those who smoke. It's a bad habit. <laughs> Quit it. Save up so much money, in 20 years you'll be able to buy a house in Kuchi. <laughs> I promise you, calculate how much money you spend on smoking. Allah, it's a bad habit. It's a very bad habit. I'm saying it in such a nice way. Come on, let, let today be the day when you quit. And please don't go home and start pumping up your wife and say, look, I, these are all withdrawals. You know? I know it happened. <laughs> One day there was a guy who was so wild in the home. And when I, his wife phones me and says, look, he did quit smoking, but now, and I told him, you know what, guy, you're just pretending. There is no excuse. If I send Mike Tyson to you now, you will sit in one corner quietly. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all ease and goodness. My brothers and sisters, a beautiful afternoon. I've only mentioned a few pointers and I hope it's motivated yourselves and myself firstly to be better Muslims and to reach out to others and to make sure that we are people who love this beautiful faith. Look, we've spoken and the points that are mentioned are actually very serious. But I tried to be as brotherly as possible in my delivery to ensure that you also feel that I'm one of you. I don't want to come and feel like a pope preaching to everyone and like I'm on another level altogether. No, no. You are my brothers and sisters. Nothing makes me better than you. We are equals in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only one who may be better is the one whom silently in their heart Allah knows that their piety levels are higher and perhaps the bulk of you may be higher than me in that. So this is why I say I just wish and I hope and I pray that Allah accepts this afternoon and this speech. And I hope if we have been moved even by one centimeter, we've achieved. May Allah bless us all. I've spoken for my time of 45 minutes. And I hope and I pray that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can help our offspring also to bear the same torch and to continue giving it to others. Make it your business to learn. Make it your business to teach others. And make it your business to be the most beautiful person you can. In your house, at your workplace, wherever you go, try to be the most beautiful person you can. Try to have the best of character and conduct. You will see that it will bring about a lot of peace. Strengthen your link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through your prayer, through all the other obligations Allah has placed upon your shoulders and abstain from sin for indeed sin only snatches away your peace. May Allah bless us all. Sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha ila ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Brothers and sisters, uh, we have uh, 15 minutes uh, to allow you to, and we have questions. So I'd like to invite the floor uh, to raise questions if you have. Uh, this is inclusive of, uh, to the non-Muslims as well. 
to see sectarian fighting and so on. Did you notice what I did when I walked in here and what I spoke about? Do you know where I came from and do you know what I've done? I believe that what I'm doing is part of the solution, inshallah. And I'd like to hope and pray that another million people do the same and that's when we'll find a solution. So we share the same concern and I am not a politician, I don't own land, I don't own a country, I don't have, I'm not a, a huge leader of some nature or so on. But what I do know, the little bit of respect Allah may have given me for temporarily now in, on the globe, I have tried my best to preach the unity amongst Muslims and uh, at the same time the peace and the tolerance amongst Muslims and even the non-Muslims like I said today. And I'd like to believe that this is part of the solution because I am one person According to my capacity, I've done what I can. And I, and I will still continue to do. But I'd like to hope and pray that there are millions of others who do the same. If every one of us seated here promises that we will do the same, and we, everyone whose lives we touch, we do the same, I think we can solve the problem to a great degree. The problem is when shaitan comes to us and makes us think, oh, this person needs to be fought and that person, you need to have love for everyone who has declared that shahada, and you need then to leave the judging of the heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows best. And as for the issue of sleeping, I mean stand in peace, just for those who might not know, there was a time in Zimbabwe when we used to lose 3,000 people a week to the AIDS menace. 3,000 people a week, that was the minimum or the average number that we had. So we had a discussion because they were saying the land is going to be short to bury people. And it was just one suggestion, random suggestion made by people to say we need to bury the guy is standing because they're taking up too much space when we line them down. So for one person you'd actually get three. And it, but obviously it was not implemented ever, but it was just on, in the discussion phase stage. And I was in that meeting and uh, we laughed at it because then someone got up and said we won't be able to say RIP, rest in peace. We will have to say SIP, which means stand in peace. <laughs> so that was just, uh, that's the joke that you're referring to. That's the issue that you're referring to. But to be honest with you, I'd like to pinpoint one of the major problems, nudity and pornography. 
is what leads to the mental, uh, the mentality changing very quick. We become dissatisfied with halal and we, our mind only thinks of haram. So I want to just make mention of what I feel is a problem because I've spoken to a lot of people who have issues and I try to help a lot of different people. And as people come to me and explain what the problem is and subhanallah, when we go a little bit deeper, we find that they have uh, watched pornographic material or they are hooked onto it or in the past they have been hooked onto it and that actually changes you because you know you have uh, a spouse or the opposite sex and you're attracted to when you get uh, hooked onto pornography you lose respect of them you start thinking of them as a sex object and then you're not satisfied because pornography takes you from stage to stage and it actually goes so high you become high on dopamine dopamine uh, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us, it actually turns the mind to become, uh, you know, sexually totally different from what you might have been in the past as well. So there are a lot of studies that are actually false, intentionally false in order to con people that you guys don't worry, it's completely normal, it's natural. But if you study from an Islamic perspective, you would come to realize that the Quran speaks about something unique. And the Quran says this never happened before the Prophet Lut And at the same time, if a person is engaged in any form of immorality, it leads them to something worse. And I want to tell you for your information, in about 10 years from now, the world will be fighting for the rights to have sex with animals. Already it has started. Already it has started. And I've already come across, uh, you know, the bestiality rights where people are saying, what's wrong? It's our right. We were born like this. It's natural. We just feel inclined towards the sheep. Astaghfirullah. We might laugh at it, but wallahi, it's there. So, I, I, I want to, I cry when I think of the day when, when it will be in the syllabuses of the kids and they will be taught that it's normal to have a sheep as your spouse. <laughs> yeah? The, those who are promoting these type of rights need to know that it's going to go further and further. It's not going to just stop there. So be careful. And like I said, there is a problem, there is a, a reason why it's happening. It's because of nudity and at the same time a lot of open pornography. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say God is. I want to tell you something interesting. I was looking at the definition of pornography over time. Do you know that they've changed it? They've changed it to exclude a lot of pornography. So now when you look at pornography and its definition, the latest definitions, you will find that it excludes works of art. So if, if, you have a, if you have a pornographic picture, but your intention was art, you can say this is artistic, and yet it's pornographic. Did you know this? So, but uh, some time back, art was part of pornography. They didn't look at it, whether it's art or, 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 or something else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, if God is my brother, if we would like peace, we need to promote peace. That's the answer for your first question. And if we would like peace, we need to abstain from nudity and pornography. That's the answer for your second question. Allah knows best.